On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would come in to the most holy place. But before going in to where the very presence of God dwelt, he would see this imposing veil. The veil was a visible representation of a spiritual reality. The fact that we are separated from God because of our sinfulness, because God in His holiness cannot look upon sin. As we've been talking about in our sessions, all Scripture points to and finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Jesus' body that was on the cross, dying for our sins, His body was the veil that was torn for us so that we might have access to the Father because of His sacrifice. So I want to invite you to come with me as we conclude this journey through the tabernacle and hear God's greater story. And so as we walk past the, the laver, we peel back the curtain that goes into the holy place. To the left, we see the lampstand. And we know that it was very strategically placed there because it would give light to the holy place. But it speaks a much, dipper, a much deeper story, and that is that we have been strategically placed in this world. And the light of Christ that dwells in us is to shine out into the world. That we're to be a reflection of God's glory wherever we are for such a time as this. And as we look to the right, we see the table, the bread of presence. Um, that represents God's covenant with us through His Son, Jesus Christ, that represents this, this provision He's made for us to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, who provides for us spiritually. And also, uh, this invitation to come and dine with Him, to sup with Him, this invitation to His table, the King's table, that He's invited us, undeserving us, broken us. Uh, he has invited us to His table um, because of His great mercy. And then the altar of incense, our prayers going up before a holy God. This invitation again to commune with Him and to offer up our prayers to Him. But now we come to the veil. And it's this imposing veil, this curtain that is hanging down. And Scripture speaks of that in Exodus chapter 26, beginning with verse 31. I want to read to you what the text of God's Word says regarding the veil. It says, And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. And it shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it and you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold with hooks of gold on four bases of silver and you shall hang the veil from the clasp and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil and the veil shall separate for you the holy place place from the most holy place so as the the high priest would approach the most holy place he would be met with this Veil, And it was a very colorful veil. There, it was made of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen is what the scripture tells us. Now each of those colors are very significant. The blue represents God's holiness. The truth that God is holy, that he is, he is without sin obviously and that we as sinners are approaching a holy God. It's a reminder that what lies behind the veil is the very holy presence of God. So blue represents the holiness of God. Purple represents the royalty or kingship. And we know that God is king. It also reminds us of his immeasurable worth. So as we look at the veil and we see the blue, his holiness, the purple representing his kingship, his royalty, that there is no one like God in all the earth. We see this in the veil. And then the scarlet. The scarlet would represent the sin of humanity. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, Isaiah speaks of this, that our sins are are as scarlet, but God's desire is to wash our sins away and make our hearts, make us white as snow. This cleanliness, this, this cleansing that takes place that we see in the picture of God's word, but also in the tabernacle. So as we look at the scarlet that is woven into the veil, it also represents this blood that was shed by Christ on our behalf for our sinfulness. So what it represents is our sinfulness, but it also could represent the blood that Christ shed for us that would take away our sinfulness. So as the high priest approaches the veil in the most holy place, he is met with this imposing curtain, this veil that reminds him of his sinfulness and reminds him of the sinfulness of all humanity and that no one, not just anyone, could go beyond the veil. Now, as you look at the veil, it's not just the colors that you would see, but the cherubim as well that are woven into this veil. It must have been a beautiful curtain. And in its beauty, there is also this sense of awe and reverence. But if you see, as you see the cherubim that are woven into it, you have to understand that these cherubim, as we find in Scripture, are angelic beings who act on God's behalf. We also know that they are protectors of God's majesty. We see that in Scripture. 
in the Garden of Eden, I shared with you in, four, in, in, a, in a few sessions ago that, that when Adam and Eve were, were banished from the Garden of Eden, that it, and they were banished to the east, that this entrance into the Garden of Eden was now protected by a cherubim who had a flaming sword. They're protectors of God's majesty. The Bible says in Genesis 3, 24, he drove out the man and out of the, in, out of the east end of the garden and he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. They're protectors or guardians of God's majesty. And so as the high priest sees this cherubim up on the veil, he's reminded that they are guarding the majesty of God and what lies behind the veil is the majesty of God. We see it in the tabernacle and the temple as well, the cherubim. Guardians of God's majesty, protectors of his majesty, angelic beings. And around God's throne, we find that in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, one of my favorite passages of scripture that reads, And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature like with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. That was their responsibility, to just speak of God's majesty and His holiness. Holy, 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 a reference to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. This veil not only had this woven on it, but as you know, it separated the holy place from the most holy place. And it's said by Jewish historian Josephus that it was no less than four inches thick, which reminds us that, that, not, that mere human hands could not tear this veil. And we know that when Christ died and the veil was torn in the temple, it was not torn from the bottom to the top. It was torn from the top to the bottom, which indicates the fact that it's not us that initiates this relationship with God to bring us into right relationship with Him, but God initiates that relationship. It's God who separates the veil. It's God who tears it, not us that we could work our way to God. It's only by His grace, through faith, that we're saved. And the veil speaks of that. So it's this imposing, this imposing curtain. And here's the truth that should resonate in us and that we need to understand, is that the veil was a physical representation of a spiritual reality. That just as the veil physically separated the holy place from the most holy place, from God's presence, that our sin separates us from a holy God. So it was a physical representation of a spiritual reality. And here's what it would remind us of. The veil was a symbol of what was lost because of sin. In Genesis chapter 3, you've heard me refer to this, that, that we lost this, this intimacy with God, this relationship, this, this life that we had with God. And Adam and Eve had, had life forever with God in this garden. But because of sin, they were separated from Him and they experienced death. Not just physically would they die, but now spiritual death. And the veil is a reminder of what was lost because of sin. So as the, as the priest, the high priest would approach the veil, he would see and be reminded of all that was lost. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Paul says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, speaking of Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. That means every single one of us. All of us are sinners. We are separated from God. There's not one of us who can say we're righteous. So the veil reminds us of that, that we're all sinners. Another reality is that the veil was a symbol of what would be gained because of Jesus Christ. If it tells us what was lost because of sin, it also tells us what will be gained because of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 and 27, listen to what God's word says. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. The veil reminds us that we have a high priest in Jesus Christ who was sinless, without blemish, without defect, who offered himself up as our sacrifice. And because of his sacrifice for us, we're able to not have to offer sacrifices daily, but we surrender our lives to him and experience this life and forgiveness 
that ushers us in the very presence of God. Not just only ushers us in his presence, but allows us to be able to have his presence in us. What an incredible truth. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, not of this creation, he's speaking of the body of Christ, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood or goats or calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Jesus Christ did that for us. Our high priest, he wasn't separated from the veil. His body was the veil. His body was torn on the cross for us so that we could have direct access to God. We don't have to go to a priest in order to have access to God because Jesus Christ is our mediator, the high priest, who makes a way for us to the Father. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So we look at the veil and we see this, that peace with God is available to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. That we can have this peace with God if we would trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Paul says again in Romans, it's therefore since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope and the of the glory of God. I love what Paul says. Through him we have obtained access by faith. That's, a, that's an all-access pass. I don't know if you've ever been to a concert before, maybe your favorite band, and, and you got to sit out in the audience, but somebody came and says, hey, I've got a backstage pass. We're going to get to meet the band, and you got all excited about that. I don't know if you're Beatles fans or, you know, if you're Rolling Stones or, or what your favorite group has been in the past, or, but, but maybe you got a chance to meet some of those. You thought, man, this is exciting. We're not talking about a rock band. We're talking about the king of all the universe. We're talking about the God of heaven. We're talking about the creator God, and we have access to him through Jesus Christ. That's what the veil would represent. But now the high priest, having made the preparations, now begins to pull back the veil. Can you imagine what he must have felt? Knowing that he's going from the holy place now into the very presence of holy God. He had to have everything right so that he wouldn't die. He had to be pure so that he could live and offer atonement, splashing the blood on the mercy seat for the sins of the people. And so we come and we look in this most holy place and there is the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. Only once a year the high priest could enter, and it was on the Day of Atonement. It's also known as Yom Kippur. So that he might make sacrifice and offer this sacrifice for the sins of the people of Israel. So you have the Ark of the Covenant, and then you have the mercy seat, which rested upon the Ark with the cherubim facing one another, and their wings were spread over the Ark. In other words, this was the very throne room of God in the tabernacle. This is where he would, his presence would rest and God's glory would dwell there in the midst of the Israelites. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was obviously the place of God's presence. It was the place where God met and talked with Moses. We see that in the Scripture. It's the central focus of the tabernacle. And within the Ark itself, it contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments, a jar of manna, and also Aaron's staff. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4 tells us that having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that, that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The Ten Commandments. The Scripture tells us, And in the Ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. The law of God that reminds us, it shows us that we're sinful. The law exposes our sinfulness. It shows us and tells us how sinful we are against a holy God. So there in the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments, or the tablets of the stone, that show us that we have, are sinners against a holy God. Then the jar of manna, Exodus chapter 16, tells us, As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. This provision that God reminds us of, this manna, and also Aaron's staff. The rod of Aaron says, And the Lord said to Moses, Put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony. We find that in Numbers chapter 17. Now remember, as we walk through this study of the tabernacle, you've heard me say over and over again that all Scripture points to and finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And so when we look at Jesus and the Ark of the Covenant, we see Jesus Christ, who is now the visible presence of God. The very visible presence of God, the image of God, God in the flesh that we see this. When we look at the testimony or the tablets of the commandments, we see that pointing to something greater, something bigger. We see that pointing to Christ in that this is what's true. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill the law. I mean, even John writes, the Gospel of John, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He says that in John chapter 1, verse 14. So we know that, which is the second thing. The Word was made flesh. So he was not just the fulfillment of the law, but the law now is made flesh. And it says the word became flesh, it dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So now the, the law, the Ten Commandments, the tablets would point to the person of Jesus, that he's the fulfillment of the law, that the word has been made flesh. And here's the third thing, that the Torah revealed in and through Jesus Christ. The law was revealed in and through Jesus. And here's what I mean by that. Jesus made this statement. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. What the law does is it exposes our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. And not just any Savior, but the, the Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who was without, without sin, the one who made the sacrifice on the cross for us. And so the law exposes our sinfulness. It reveals our need for a Savior. And when Jesus said, on the way, the truth, and the life, there's something deeper even in that he's saying. You see, the Jewish people referred to the Torah as the way. The way to God was by keeping the Torah. They also referred to the Torah as truth, that the Torah was complete truth. They also referred to the Torah as life. So when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he wasn't just making an exclusive statement about our salvation in Christ. That's true. But he was also saying to the Jewish people and to the religious officials and all those who were seeking to ridicule him and entrap him and eventually crucify him, he's saying, I am the Torah in the flesh. I am the word made flesh. So that's the Ten Commandments that points to Jesus. Then we look at the jar of manna. And we see the bread of life that was rained down from heaven. We talked about that in a previous session. How God rained down manna, rained down bread from heaven. And Jesus made the statement in John chapter 6 that he is the bread that was rained down from heaven. So we know that the jar of manna that was in the Ark of the Covenant that represents the presence of God. Jesus now the visible presence of that says, I am the law fulfilled. I am the law in the flesh. I am the Torah in the flesh revealed to you, and I'm also your provision. I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread of life, the one born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, uh, this, this bread. I am also the one who, is, who provides for you salvation through my sacrifice. So Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And then we look at Aaron's staff, and we realize that that is a symbol of appointment, that Aaron was the one appointed as high priest, and that staff was given to him as, as a sign of, of him being appointed or called by God to be the high priest. In the same way, Jesus Christ is the chosen Messiah. He is the one whom God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the Messiah. He's the one who would come and die on the cross for your sins. In John chapter 1, verse 29 through 31, you've heard me read this text before, but it's worthy of reading, it, reading again. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. That's what John the Baptist was saying of Jesus Christ. He's saying the one that we knew who would be appointed, the one who would be the chosen one, this is him. He is the one. And so Aaron's staff would point to something much greater, and that would be the fact that Jesus would be the appointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah, who would deliver us from our sin, who would, again, usher us into the very presence of God. 
So we know that the way into God's presence is through the word revealed in his son. The way into his presence is through the bread of life revealed in his son. And the way into God's presence is through the chosen one, Jesus Christ. So here's the truth that needs to resonate with us. To experience God's presence both now and forever, we must come through his son, Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other person. It's only through Jesus. So as we look at the veil, we move beyond it, we see the Ark of the Covenant and what it represents and the contents within the Ark of the Covenant. We look at now the mercy seat that rests upon the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim with their wings outstretched, them facing one another, and it serves as the very throne of God, this mercy seat. We find that in Exodus chapter 25. Beginning with verse 17, if you have your Bible, look there if you would please. In Exodus chapter 25, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and the cherub on the other end of one piece with the mercy seat. Shall you make the cherubim? On its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. Therefore I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Now here's what I find interesting. That the mercy seat rests upon the ark. Remember the ark of the covenant had the, word, had the testimony, the tablets, had the jar of manna and also the staff of Aaron in the ark of the covenant. What it does, it exposes our sinfulness. If the ark exposes our sinfulness and the holiness of God, God's mercy seat is what covers us. We're covered by his mercy. Once a year, the high priest would, would take the blood of a sacrifice and he would approach the mercy seat. And on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest would sprinkle blood seven times on the mercy seat. Significant. Why? Because the number seven is the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. It's the number for holiness. And so now you have this high priest sprinkling seven times on the mercy seat saying that this blood will perfectly cover the sins of the people. Now remember, it's pointing to something greater. We're going to get to that in just a second as we wrap this session up. But the high priest would come in and for seven times he would sprinkle that blood, the blood on the mercy seat. But why blood on the mercy seat? We know the scripture says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But why blood on the mercy seat? Well, it's because propitiation had to be offered for the sins of the people. Now, I know that propitiation is a big word, and I'm not a big fan of big words. So let's, let's look at what propitiation means. It, it's, it, what it means is it's a just payment to satisfy and turn away God's wrath. There had to be payment for sin. And that's what propitiation is. It's, it's a payment. And it's a just payment. It's, it's a full payment. It's not partial payment. It's full payment. And so there had to be full payment for the sin that we've committed. In Leviticus 16, the Bible says, And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his fingers on the front of the mercy seat, on the east side, in the front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his fingers seven times. In Leviticus 17, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So the, the innocent blood of, a, of an animal whose life is taken, the blood is shed and is sprinkled on the mercy seat, is a picture of Christ's blood shed on the cross for us. It's this payment that there had to be a just payment in order for us to be forgiven of sin. So that's why blood was on the mercy seat. But also, this payment was necessary so that atonement might be made. The word atonement literally means covering. That we might be able to be one with Christ. In other words, be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's this covering or the taking away of sin that we might be in right relationship with Him. Leviticus speaks of this, that the blood covers us and we are atoned. Now, we move forward and we see that everything in Scripture finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. 
And so we ask the question, if there's blood on the mercy seat, then why did there have to be blood on the cross? Well, in Hebrews chapter 9, we've looked at before that Christ has made this sacrifice for us. He's offered this sacrifice once and for all to bear the sins of many, and He'll appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting Him. That Jesus Christ did not have to go in and suffer repeatedly and make sacrifices repeatedly once a year like the high priest did. Jesus made the sacrifice once for all for our sin. And there had to be blood on the cross. Jesus' death on the cross is the propitiation or the payment for our sins. 1 John tells us that in 1 John 2.2. 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours but only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's not just for you and not just for me, but it's for everyone. And so Jesus' blood was not just sprinkled on the cross. It was splattered on the cross. It was shed on the cross. It was a cruel death. The blood of an innocent Man, Jesus Christ, who is fully God, fully man, for the guilt of us. But also Jesus' propitiation for our sins has satisfied God's wrath and offers us reconciliation with God. When God looked upon his son's sacrifice, when Jesus said, it is finished, God was pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And because of that, the veil was torn, symbolizing the fact that no longer did we not have access to God the Father. The tearing of the veil was God's way of saying, I am pleased with the sacrifice of my son. And now he reconciles us. He brings what's been broken because of sin into relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Here is the great news of the gospel, though. That love and justice collided at the cross and it's there that God's wrath is satisfied and reconciliation is offered. You see, God is a God of love, but God is also a just God. And a just God demands a just payment for sin. It would be like going before a judge, and as you're before a judge and you're in this courtroom, and you're there because you are, are, are listening to a case of someone who has committed a hideous crime, a crime of murder, and all the evidence stacks up against this one, who has committed this crime. And as you're observing in the courtroom what this judge will do, you're thinking this judge would be a just and fair judge. But as all the evidence is laid out, he comes back and he renders his verdict and he says, you've lived most of your life really well. You've made this mistake. You've committed this hideous crime. It's, it's, it's obvious. And all the evidence is stacked against you. But I'm going to let you go. There's no payment needed. I'm just going to let you go. Now you, sitting in the audience, you probably would think, how can this be? That, that judge is not being just and fair. Well, in the same way, how could we expect God to be just and let us off as sinners? There has to be just payment. And Jesus said, I'll make the payment through my blood that they might be set free. Love and justice collided at the cross. And it's there that God's wrath is satisfied and that we are able to be reconciled with God. That's the story God's telling through the tabernacle. From the outer courtyard, past the altar of burnt offering, the sacrifice that was needed, past the labor that represents us being clean before God, to the lampstand that says, now the sacrifice has been made and you've been made clean. You are now the light of the world. Shine for Christ. And the bread of presence, because I, I, li I dwell in you, I want to commune with you. I want you to feast on me. And as you do, respond to me with your prayers and your life that's pleasing to me, a pleasing aroma. And know that there's no longer a veil that separates you. You can enter boldly in the confidence of Christ because of what he's done for us. We can enter boldly before his throne and come before him and receive the mercy because of the blood of Christ that's been shed for us. That's the story of the tabernacle. And God is speaking to us clearly.